Now, today we're going to be working through Lightroom. This is where I keep a catalog of images. All of the changes that we make inside of Perfect Black and White, it doesn't matter what program you start out with. So if you like to use Aperture, Lightroom, Photoshop, or Photoshop Elements, Perfect Black and White is going to work with all of those. You can also use the program as a standalone. So you can open it up like I did as an individual application. It'll start you out in our program called Perfect Layers, or you can browse through images using Perfect Browse, and you can find the photos that you want to have access to. So it doesn't really matter where you start out. It matters where you end up. And so we're going to be ending up in black and white, obviously. But I have most of my images here inside Lightroom, one of the reasons why I'm going to be using it today. We're not going over a lot of, a lot of stuff here for Lightroom and using the program. If you've got questions about integrating the suite into different workflows, jump over to our website and we'll have a bit more information about that. Now, we're going to start out with kind of the basics of black and white editing. And I've got some really, really cool stuff that I want to show you today. And we're going to go with it like this one. This is a pretty, pretty simple photo. It's in um, right outside of Portland. It's one of the only times that we ever get snow in the wintertime. It doesn't really get inside Portland. You have to draw quite a ways out of the city. And it's usually about the amount of snow you're going to get anyways. So it was a little bit of a dusting. That's it. So um, this is a great example of an image that I want to make black and white because I want to give it a little bit more oomph. Now, in color, it's surprisingly flat. There are basically only two or three colors that are going on here. There's yellows, greens, and blues, which yellow and blue combined together create green. So really it's just two colors. We've got yellows and blues and that's it. We don't have a lot of interest in this image other than the fact that it's snowing and I want to pull out a little bit more detail and make this image pop out a bit. And in color, it's just, it's not really, it's a little flat, if you will. Usually when I'm editing color-based landscapes, I want them to have some form of a pop, a color pop. This would be a good example of that. We've got a lot of beautiful cool tones on the top. We've got warmer tones on the bottom. The colors are part of what make this image important. If we turn this into a black and white, the bottom part of the image and the top would kind of blend together. We would lose that difference in the top and the bottom, not just in the color, but also in the detail because that's helping enhance the colors. So making this into a black and white doesn't make as much sense because the color is very important to my final photo. There are many other images that could definitely go both ways. There's a photo like this one that's important because the color is based off of the time of day. This isn't 100% an image that I would put into my black and white category. The yellows that are coming across the foreground here where the field is, and then those warm yellows and oranges that are hitting the edges of the beach and the hills that are coming up above the beach. Those yellows are important to figuring out what time of day this photo was shot. And even though I could make this black and white, it may make a good black and white image. The color is, again, part of what makes this image important. And the color is a large part of me showing the viewer why I took this photo in the first place. So one of the things that I do want to mention is think about what photos you're going to be putting in black and white and think about the role of color as you're doing so. This image, the color doesn't really matter. We can make this black and white, we can make it color, and not a lot of people are really going to notice that much of a difference because it's already pretty flat. And because it was snowing, we've got a beautiful white backdrop and there's already white on the leaves. And we'll be able to tell black and white or color that that's happening. There's not going to be a huge difference. Whereas when you're looking at an image like this one here, that color is important. So just a little note about trying to figure out what photos are going to be black and white and which ones aren't. Let's go ahead and let's take this into perfect black and white. I'm just going to right click and go to edit in and choose perfect black and white. And I'm going to make sure I edit a copy of my image just so that I don't destroy my original photo. That'll give me the ability to come back and re-edit again if I'd like to. I recommend you always edit a color copy and a black and white copy just because especially if you're working with clients or you're going to be showing images somewhere because you want to see if they're going to go up on a gallery wall or you want to print out a couple of versions for someone. Having a color version and having a black and white version can be really helpful and you can have people look at both of them and say, you know, I like the black and white, not a big fan of the color or vice versa. So. It doesn't matter what program you work in, you always want to create a copy so that you have your black and white and your color versions. 
We're going to go ahead and click edit and we're going to jump over into the program. Now, landscapes are going to be a little bit different than working on portraits. Whew, tongue tied there for a second. One of the great things about landscapes is that you've got a little bit more leeway when it comes to working with detail and when it comes to working with contrast. If you're working on portraits, and you'll probably hear this a lot when, when doing black and white based editing on portraits, you wanna be careful of how much detail or contrast you add to the image because that can affect the way that the, person, the person's skin looks. If you're working on beauty portraits, especially, adding a lot of detail and making it extremely high contrast can change the way that the skin is not just shaded, but if you add too much detail, it can make their pores pop out in places that you don't want. It can make their clothing look really gritty because the detail can go overboard on things like knit and cotton-based clothing. So there are lots of reasons why high contrast, high detail images when it comes to portraits are not always the most popular. Usually the only time you see that is when you're working on images um, shot with very slim lighting. Um, usually it's athlete based photos that you'll see that on. A lot of Nike advertisements do this where they have very, very thin lights on the edges of a portrait and then they pump up the detail. That's one of the only times you're going to be able to do that. When you're working on landscapes, you can add as much detail, as much contrast, and as much high intensity as you want without having to worry about over, over detailing someone's skin or someone's face. Now, the first thing that I like to do when I'm working on an image in black and white is I like to go over and jump to the tone pane. You want to make sure that you've got a pretty good exposure for your image as you start out. Now, this is because I'm going to be doing everything manually today, which means I'm not going to be working with the presets. However, I'm going to go ahead and point them out just because the presets can also be extremely useful. If you're new to Perfect Black and White, you haven't really had a lot of time to get to know the layout, the presets are a good place to start, and they affect all of the different panes that you can access on the right-hand side of the screen. And I'm going to close them up here just so that we can take a look. You have everything from tonal information. You can add things like glows, film grains, toners. You can finish images off with vignettes, borders, and sharpening. So we've got all of these different panes on the right. And each one of the different presets that you apply will adjust the panes over here. Now, there are many different ways that we can go with landscape images. One of the most popular presets that you're going to find out there for landscape photos is this one called Ansel in the Valley. And if you find a preset that you really love, just click on it once and it will add it to your photo and then it will adjust the right hand side for you automatically. So you'll see it added film grain. You can take a look at that on off switch on the right hand side. So it added film grain, it added a toner, it added vignettes. And then it also went in and adjusted things in the tone pane. If you don't like a preset for whatever reason, just click on another one and you can see whether you like that one better. Now, one of the best parts about working with presets is that you can get some really interesting results. You can also see things that you may not necessarily have seen the first time around. This image here is perfect for doing some form of a film style treatment on it. Because it's a pretty flat photo in general, there isn't a huge amount of interest in this image other than the fact that the trees are beautiful, they're coated in snow, we can see a little bit of the snow coming down just in the foreground of the image, but it doesn't have a huge section of interest like a photo. I'm actually going to pop over. We're going to look at, where is it? There it is. So we've got a photo like this one. This has a little bit more interest. It has a subject in the foreground. Now this is technically still a landscape, even though it's it's shot of a building um, and a couple of trucks. It still counts as kind of a landscape-based image, even though it's got some human elements in it. We still consider things like urban landscapes, landscapes. Um, this has a little bit more interest to it. It's got a building. It's got a couple of trucks in the foreground. This was taken of an old cotton gin down in the south that actually still runs and still works. And adding a vintage-based treatment on this is going to pull away from the subjects that are in the center of the photo. Whereas an image like the one that we're working on today, because it's a little bit flatter, it's a little bit softer as far as subjects go, we can play around a little bit more with it. So 
playing with these presets can be a good way to discover what way you'd like to go with your image. And I'm going to end up going in this direction. We're going to be doing kind of this film style, like dark room, very gritty dark room toner technique. Now, once you apply a preset, everything can be changed. You're not stuck doing it manually on the right or choosing a preset on the left. You can combine both of these options. And when you're working, after you've applied a preset, there's a little black line in between the presets library and the preview of your image that I'm kind of hovering over right now. If you click and drag this to the left, you get a larger view of your image while you're working on it. And I recommend that you do that just because it's going to it's going to save you a little bit of time if you're zooming in and out quite a bit to kind of take a look at some of the details in your photo. It's also nicer because you've got a bigger view of your image. Now, once we've applied a preset, we need to start out with tone. We need to make sure that the tones in this image are the way that we want them. It's also recommended that if you apply a preset like this one and you don't like the border, to turn it off right away. We can turn it back on later if we do want it, but now I can see that border was cutting off some of my image there. And by turning it off, I can make sure that my entire photo looks good with or without a border. So keep your borders for last. That's one of the reasons why it's down all the way at the bottom here, is you want to add things like borders and sharpening last. And we put a lot of these panels in a specific order because you do want to start out with things like tone at the beginning. Now, I'm going to zero everything out for this image just because I want to make sure that I can show you guys some of the tips for working on these landscape images. Now, the first thing here are going to be your whites and your blacks. I pretty much leave brightness and contrast alone unless I'm really going to be overcompensating. If my photo is pretty dark, then I'll take the brightness slider and move it to the right. Or if it's really, really light, I'll move the brightness slider to the left. But I do most of my exposure-based adjustments using the whites, the blacks, and the shadow and the highlight recovery sliders. These increase the black and white points of your image. And this is the best way to create contrast because you can be more specific about how intense certain tones are. If you add flat contrast on your image, it can make the photo look almost posterized, if you will. It also evenly distributes the lighter whites and the darker blacks. However, in a photo, sometimes you're going to want to increase the blacks more and then increase the whites less or vice versa. Maybe we want to brighten up the whites even more and leave the blacks extremely low. So these whites and black sliders are going to give you more of a manual adjustment and that can be important. It's also really nice because you still have your shadow and your highlight recovery sliders. So if we need to go through and recover some of the highlight information and by pushing the highlight slider over to the right, you'll see that the sky is getting a little bit darker we're almost adding a bit of a fade, which is very significant when you're working on film style looks, because you'll see this a lot in the darkroom. When you print out a photo, you're going to get kind of a, a fade or a haze over some of the highlights in your image or the shadows in your photo, and that's very indicative of working in the darkroom. So I can take my highlights letter and move it over to the right to make sure that I maintain that softness in the brighter, whiter spots of the image. And then the last slider down here that's really important is going to be detail. Like I mentioned before, we can pump up the detail, which is basically, it works very similarly to local contrast, which I'm suspecting a lot of you guys have probably used before. It's just going in and it's going to be crisping up the details in the image. And you can really see the difference as I push it over to the right. Now, pushing it all the way to 100 can get you something that looks a little overdone. It's up to you how, how much of this style you want on your photos. This is pretty popular these days. You'll see images that have kind of a lot of local contrast. They've got that almost faux HDR style to it. That's not usually how I like to edit my images, so I keep my detail slider below 50 um, with landscape images because it seems to help avoid that kind of crunchy look that you can get around the edges. Now, we're going to keep on we're going to keep on talking about a lot of the other pains, but one of the last things that I want to mention are clipping masks. And 
if you've if you've done any heavy editing in programs like Photoshop or Lightroom, or if you've ever been to a talk or a conference about photo editing, you'll hear all about histograms and clipping. Now, the histogram you can actually find on the top right hand corner of your screen. Right now we've got the navigator on so we can navigate around our image. And then when I click on the histogram, this is a distribution of the whites and the blacks in my image. The left hand side right here is going to be your blacks and your shadows. The right hand side, this is going to be the spike in your highlights and your whites. And then the center here are going to be your midtones. If you want a high contrast look on your photos, you want to make sure that you've got a higher peak on the far right and the far left, and then you want a larger dip in the middle where the midtones are. So as I push the black slider to the right and the white slider to the right, you're going to see we're getting these, I'm going overboard obviously, but you can see these huge spikes on the left and the right in the whites and the blacks and it's keeping those midtones nice and low. If I drop everything down to zero and we'll decrease the contrast, you'll see now I'm getting this large bump in the middle, which means my midtones are popping out. It's, it's independent per person as to what they think looks best. Um, I typically like my photos to have a higher contrast to them. I think it gives them a little bit more oomph, a little bit more of a pop. Some people like that kind of flatter, grayer look just because you're getting all of the tones in an image. This photo doesn't really need it. There isn't a lot of information in the sky. I shot it so that I could I could expose more for the foreground than the, than the bright white sky. So there's not much I'm worrying about as far as clipped highlights or clipped shadows. Now what the word clipped means, and I've used this a couple of times now and we've talked about clipping, is clipping indicates the bright whites white whites and the dark blacks in an image that will be printed out on a on a piece of paper they will be solidly white or solidly black um, most of the time when you're working on photos everything is going to somehow fall into a mid-range it's going to fall into the midtones it doesn't seem like it but a large portion of this image it's still going to be mixing lighter and darker tones together to create the look there are only a couple of select just solid black and solid white pixels in a photo. Now you can actually view those by jumping up to your view menu and scrolling down to this option called show clipping. And it will give you the ability to show how much of your image is being clipped out. Now there isn't, there really, despite the fact that it may look this way, there really isn't anything in this photo that's being clipped out. This, because we moved that highlight slider all the way over to the right, we actually pulled more information into the sky and we didn't increase the blacks enough to really lose information down on the bottom of our photo. Now we're gonna turn some of this stuff off so that I can show you kind of how clipping works. When I hold down the J key on my keyboard, anything that is blue is going to be solidly black. Anything that is red is going to be solidly white. I can hold the J key on and off, and you can obviously see it in the image because I really increased the contrast here. But this is a kind of starker representation of the darker tones and the lighter tones in an image. Now, by holding down the J key and moving some of these sliders, if I move the black slider to the left, all the way over just right to the end, you can only see a couple of little blue pixels down in the, the right hand corner. And then as I move the white pixels, the white slider, those red pixels will start to disappear. And we're gonna move it over just enough to start getting rid of those white pixels and that's it. You can also, if you've got it pretty heavily overboard here, or your image was naturally darker or lighter, you can also move the shadow sliders to the right and the highlight slider to the left to pull more information in. So you've got two different ways of going through and doing that, and it's up to you what, what you think is gonna work best. So you can just turn it on and off by holding that J key on your keyboard, and it'll pop back and forth. So when you're working with clipping and you're viewing this, it can be very helpful to make sure that you're not losing a lot of information in a photo. 
and that can happen pretty quickly on an image, especially like this one that has a very white, bright background. I'm going to turn that toner back on there. When you're working with when you're working with toned images, none of these are going to be solidly black or solidly white just because it has a color base on it. So it's not going to print out just white or just black. It's going to print out a light for this image. It's going to print out a light yellow. And for this photo, it's going to print out a dark brown. So they're not solidly black or white. They don't have they don't have the removal of color information because a toner is applied. But if you turn the toner on and off, that clipping mask will pop up and will go away, depending on what your application is. Now, let's go ahead and I'm going to move these over just a little bit more to the right because we want to intensify that contrast. And we're going to close out the tone pane. The next thing that I want to talk to you about is our color response pane. And we talk about it quite a bit, but I'm going to give you a very, very simple overview of what it is. The color response pane looks at the original colors in your image. You can actually turn your preview on and off by pressing Control or Command P, and you'll be able to see your original color image. And as we talked about before, it's pretty much just yellows, greens, and blues. There aren't a lot of other colors here. There's a little bit of reds down at the bottom, maybe a couple of magentas in the trees, but not a lot. Um, it really is pretty heavy on the yellows and the greens. Because of that fact, we have two different sliders, yellow and green, that we can move to the right and the left to lighten or darken those colors in an image. By moving the yellows and the greens to the left and the right, we can choose how light or how dark those sections of the image are. Now, what's great about this is when you're working on a landscape, I'm going to jump over to Lightroom here, just so that I can show you a couple of really good examples of this. When you're working on a landscape, let's say like this one, it's very boring, very simple, but it's a great illustration of color separation. We pretty much just have blue up at the top, and then we have yellows, greens, and reds down on the bottom. Let's say we took this image into black and white, and we wanted to darken just the top part of our photo. Instead of having to create masks, having to hand darken the top, because we have these sliders in black and white, I can just darken the blues and just lighten the yellows and the greens and create a different value for this image. Let me jump back over to the photo suite here. That's what these sliders can do for you. As I move the the yellow slider to the left and the right, I can choose how light or how dark I want those trees to really be. By pulling them to the left, I can create a higher, higher contrast in the image overall because I'm darkening a lot of these spots right in the center of the trees. If I pop the green slider to the left, I'm doing the same thing. I'm making some of those areas lighter and darker. So this is a good separation for your image and it works particularly well with landscapes because most of the time you're going to be shooting images where the sky is going to be a different color than your foreground. There are also filter presets and these are based off of old school black and white photography techniques. So when you used to shoot black and white film, you could put a color filter over an image and it would increase or decrease the brightness of a color in the photo. So it's working on value. It's not working on color information the same way that we work with it today. Um, with landscape photographers, the red was one of the most popular because it created a darker blue and then it lightened the reds and the yellows in an image. So you can play around with the filter presets up at the top. As I said, red is one of the most popular. It's not gonna do as much with this image, but you can see it's increasing the warmer tones and decreasing the cooler tones. Now, we're going to skip over glow and we're going to skip over film grain for now. I'm just going to turn the film grain pane off because we don't really need it. And I'm also going to turn the glow pane off. Now, glows can be extremely useful in an image, but they can also decrease the intensity of the detail in an image. So it's up to you how detailed you want a landscape to be, but by adding a glow, you're actually adding a little bit of a softness to the photo as a whole. So I usually turn my glows off, unless you're going for kind of an Orton style look, but that's typically based in color photography. It's not based here in black and white. I like to keep that paint, paint alone. And sometimes what can happen is you can see with this image, when you turn a glow on and off, it's increasing and decreasing the contrast. 
So I'm going to go in and maybe increase the contrast just a little bit more for this photo because we lost some of that when we were working with the glow. The one that we're going to hit up right now is the toner pane. And right now it's set to a customized toner. This is one that was created just for that preset that we applied inside Perfect Black and White. There are also a whole bunch of set presets here. Now, the most popular, I would say, for landscapes is going to be something called Selenium. And the reason why is this was the Selenium toners were very popular with um, a lot of the F64 black and white landscape photographers and art photographers, people like Ansel Adams. Selenium toner created a very clean look. It left your highlights alone, and then it added a soft, subtle plum toner to your shadows. Uh, when you worked in the darkroom and you applied a toner, what happened is the color of your highlights was based off of the color that you used for your paper. So some papers were warmer, others were cooler. So that's how you toned your highlights. To tone your shadows, you had to tone the silver that was being applied to your images. And that's what creates the, the shadowy content on the photo when you're in the darkroom. Selenium toners were just applied to the shadows. And so you had stark bright whites, which created these beautiful beautiful backgrounds for your images and then it created this very soft subtle plum color for your shadows and it gave the image a little bit more of a punch than toners like sepia. Sepia is beautiful if you really want to go for a little bit more of an old school film look. Selenium is the one that you're going to want to go for if you want a very clean black and white look. So it's going to be it's going to be up to you which one is is going to work best. But those are typically the ones that, that I find work the best. Now, the custom toner that we're working with here is, again, one that was created for the preset that we picked on in perfect black and white. We can adjust the toner if we want to. I'm going to leave it the way that it is just because I really, really like it. And we'll talk a bit more about toners in a, in a couple of moments. Now, the last two sections here that we're going to work on are vignettes and borders. Now that we're actually at the end of our editing process, we can turn our vignettes and borders on if we want to. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my border back on because I really like this. It's it's Type 55 film. Um, it's one of the best, coolest films that you used to be able to shoot. It was absolutely beautiful and it created these really cool kind of transfer style borders. And these are great, again, for creating a really cool kind of old school film look. And it can work great, particularly for landscapes like this one as we, again, talked about earlier with the flatter style of landscape versus ones that pop out a bit more. We're giving the image a little bit more interest than just flat because the photo itself is a little bit flatter. So we're kind of saving this image a bit by adding a border. We're giving it a little bit more interest. The vignette, after we applied the border, one of the things that you're going to see is it's adding these kind of texture styles around the top in the sky. And this is just based off of the border itself. It's giving it these almost this grungy vignette. Because it's doing that, we can increase the, the vignette in the actual pane up above. So we can create something that's a little bit darker and more intense. And because of the border we're using, it's working with that border to create a more intense style. This will be different if you're not working with a border, because if I'm pushing the brightness over to the, to the left even more, we're creating something that's very fake looking. There is a great part about using the vignette pane where you can change the style of it. And subtle is the one that I think most people use. It blends in that dark black overlay that's being applied to the image. It blends it in a little bit more. So you're creating a natural vignette, whereas the normal option is one that's very much um, added after the fact. So we're going to choose subtle when we're working on an image that's alone, that doesn't have a border. But when we apply the border, the normal option is going to work a little bit better because it's going to blend with the border better. So we're going to adjust our vignette there. And once we are done and we've got our vignette and our border applied, the last thing that you're going to want to do is apply sharpening. The only time that I ever apply sharpening is when I know that I'm going to be prepping my image for print or the photo itself is a little hazy. This image isn't really that hazy. Um, it was shot at a pretty decent ISO. 
Um, it was also shot at a pretty decent speed. So I don't need to worry about that much. Um, so I'm not going to fix focus in this image. I'm going to prep this photo for printing. And so sharpening here is going to let me do this all in one fell swoop. Now, when you are sharpening, you can turn the pane on, but you want to zoom into your image to at least 50 to 100%. You want to take a closer look at what the sharpening is doing on your photo. If you don't and you print your image out, you're not going to get a clear view of how the sharpening is working. And that's very important. So you can zoom in 50 or 100. It depends on what you like to do. I like to zoom all the way up to 100 because I like to, to get a nice close up view of what's going on with my pixels. There are three different types of sharpening. I typically use something called high pass. Um, the one that is I think recommended the most when you're using just very simple images, you don't want to spend a lot of excess time sharpening, you want to do something very basic, is our own brand of progressive sharpening. It's very simple, it's very subtle, and it's only got one slider. You adjust the amount. This is how intense you want the sharpening to be. You also have sections where you can protect the light and dark tones in your image from excessive sharpening. And I always push these up. You want to give them a little bit of a bump so that you don't add too much sharpness in the bright highlights and the dark shadows. Now, the amount slider, I'm going to drop it all the way down to zero, and we're going to be able to take a look at our image without sharpening. This is what our photo looked at, looked like without any sharpening on it. When we push it to the right, it's going to take a second to render and you'll be able to see it when it happens. This is what our photo looks like with sharpening. You don't want to add too much. I almost always keep my progressive sharpening under 30 because it's just punchy enough that it makes the edges look very intense, but it doesn't go overboard. You don't want to be able to notice that you've over sharpened an image when you're pulled out at the full view. So by keeping it pretty low, it's going to help fix the problem that you're going to run into when you print the photo out. You're going to get a softness that comes when you print your images out through a printer. Um, and that's just the way that printers work. They add this kind of soft haze over the image. Adding the sharpening is you're counteracting the problem that you're going to run into the printer. So you don't want to see a huge difference in your before and after image with sharpening at a full view like this image. Once we're done here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click the apply button. And it's going to go through and add these effects, and we're going to we're going to jump back into Lightroom. And this will this will end up being my my final image. This is going to be the one that we're we're pretty much done with at this point. And we're going to take another photo in, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other options you have in black and white. But this is one way of editing a landscape in the program. I went more for a classic film style look, just because that's typically what I like. But this is the image that we started out with. It's a little flat. It doesn't look great in color. It doesn't have a lot of interest to it. Um, I like the idea of the photo because it was a beautiful day. It was snowing, but maybe I didn't have a tripod with me. Maybe I didn't get the right angle or the right exposure that I was looking for. So taking it into black and white, adding a specialized treatment to it, we ended up with this image here. Much more interesting, much more beautiful. The tones look great. We have a border that actually adds interest. It doesn't detract from the photo. And we have a toner that matches the style of what we were going for. We wanted that vintage look. We wanted something a little bit more retro. Now, if you're not going for retro, which I do not blame you, do not blame you at all if you're not going for retro. There are many other ways that you can edit an image. So we're going to take another image in. This is obviously very different than the one that we saw before. This is multiple different files combined together. Um, we have a lot more work that was gone into the, for instance, the stream, making sure that it looks nice and soft. We've got everything very crisp. Everything is very much in focus. We've got a little bit of drop off in the back, but you can really see all of the moss and the leaves in the foreground. So this is obviously going to be a very different image than what we were just working on. So we're going to do a slightly different treatment for this photo. All right, so let's jump into perfect black and white. And let me click on edit. It'll transfer us over. 
And when you are planning on shooting for black and white purposes, it is recommended that you still shoot in color. You'll see that all of the images in this category in Lightroom, they're all still in color. They weren't shot in black and white. You don't ever want to do that. You want to pull in as much information as your camera can. And as I showed you with that color response pane in perfect black and white, it's important to save that color information because you can create some really interesting and very unique looks just by accessing the original colors. So always make sure you shoot in color. And the other thing that can be very important, I'm going to jump back over to Lightroom one more time, is looking for looking for geometry in real life. That's kind of how I think of it. You want to look for things like straight lines. You want to look for interesting points of focus. You want to look for high contrast situations. If that, if that really is the style that you're going for, high contrast can be great. So an, an image that may have a brighter sky or a darker foreground can actually be very beautiful in black and white because you're creating a stronger difference in values. When you're working on color and you create a high contrast look, which I'm gonna do for this image, I'm doing it on purpose, is when you're creating an image that has high contrast to it, you're getting oversaturated colors. You're paying attention to the fact that someone obviously did something to this image that's causing the photo to look wonky. But by removing the color information, you're paying less attention to the color and more attention to things like point of focus. You're paying more attention to the lines in the image itself. You're not necessarily paying as much attention to the fact that the sky is blown out because you've got much more down here that's highly detailed, that's got more oomph to it. So color can actually be a distraction. And in an image like this one, which we're gonna go through and we're gonna zero both of those out, um, in an image like this one, in color, it may not necessarily be exactly what I'm going for. But in black and white, I'm getting a different view of an image that I may not have gotten. We're pulling away some of the excess information so that we can hone in on what's really important for a photo. So looking for things like specific types of focus, looking for geometric lines, looking for things that already naturally high contrast environments, those are can create really beautiful black and white images. You also have the ability to do things like this photo where you pull everything into focus and you create a really stunning black and white HDR style look. Now, for this photo here, we're actually, we're going to leave the preset library on the left-hand side that we closed out. We're going to leave that the way that it is. We're not going to choose a preset. We're going to start from scratch. So many different ways that we can work in black and white. Just like we mentioned before, you want to start out in your tone pane. You want to make sure that the tones in your image are the way that you want them. We could brighten up the photo just a little bit overall, but I'm going to play around with my whites and my blacks. I want to create a brighter image, but I don't want to lose the darker shadows. So we're going to leave the contrast slider alone as well. And we're just going to play around with these whites and blacks. I'm going to take the detail slider and move that over to the right. We want to maintain as much high contrast detail as we can. This is an image that we could definitely go a little bit more overboard with. So we'll move that over quite a ways. I think I hit almost the same number as the last image there and then down to the color response pane. We're gonna close out the tone pane. These are gonna be instances where the filter presets are going to be fun. This is what it looks like with no filter preset. Everything is zeroed out. This is what it looks like with a red filter preset. Take a look, particularly down in this bottom right-hand corner at the flowers and the leaves as we turn this on and off. Everything looks very flat down here. There isn't a lot of high contrast. But with the red filter on, we're creating more contrast in some of these areas that we didn't see it before. We can click on any of these to play around with them. Green is going to be extremely high contrast because it's going to brighten the greens and the yellows, and it's going to darken the reds and the blues, which is very interesting. And then there's also something called infrared. This will darken everything except for the yellows in the photo. This can create a really, really, really strange look on your images. I really like the infrared filter with or without these brighter yellows. I'm going to darken them just a tad, but we're creating something that's much more interesting than what we started with. 
So we can turn it, this is what it looks like with none. This is what it looks like with infrared. I'm gonna manually adjust some of the yellows and the greens because they're a little too bright, but not a lot. We're gonna leave it the way that it is. And pop that closed. Now, the toner pane here, I'm going to turn on, and this is a great image for a selenium-based toner. We want it to be very clean and very sleek. And adding a kind of like cyanotype or maybe a copper filter, even the sepia tone filter, they're not lending to the, the clean, cl clean, crisp lines in this photo. Whereas the other image, we didn't necessarily have as many clean, crisp lines. We didn't have everything in focus. It was a little bit softer, a little muddier. So uh, a warmer toned toner looked great, but because this image is so intense as far as detail goes, the selenium is going to lend to those bright whites and then those very beautiful blacks and everything in between. So we're going to choose selenium. What's really cool about the selenium toner is you have a balance slider here. This will adjust how intense the shadow or the highlight colors are. So if we move this over to the left, the image is going to get a little bit darker. And if we move it to the right, it's going to get a little bit brighter. And that's just the fact that there is white being applied to the highlights and purple being applied to the shadows. And so moving this mix is going to choose how intense each one of those colors are. So we're going to drop that back down to 30. This can also be an image where a glow could be useful. And it doesn't seem like it right away. There are many different types of glows that you can apply to a photo. And one of the ones that can be very popular if you want a darker, deeper, kind of sleepy hollow style image is the multiply glow, which you'll find underneath the style drop down menu. It's going to add a soft glow to the darker shadows in the image and even the darker midtones to create a more intense, deeper image. You're not going to lose a lot as far as detail goes when you apply a multiply glow. You're still going to maintain a lot of the information in the photo, but you're going to get these darker, softer blacks, and that can be really useful. I'm going to turn it off for this image, but I want to show that you can get a glow without losing information. Now, there are, we're going to go through and we're going to add a very basic vignette to the image. It's not going to be very it's not going to be very intense. We're going to open up that pane and open the style drop down menu and change this to subtle because that normal option looks very odd on this image. So we want to subtly blend it into our photo and we can adjust the brightness as well as things like the size. So how close it's going to be towards the center, things like the feathering and even the roundness. The roundness slider is actually really cool because it'll change the shape of the vignette. So you can either make a rectangular vignette or a round one. What's even cooler here is we're going to make that by dropping the feather down to zero, we can actually make sure that the size and style of our vignette are right. And we can make sure that it's in place before we add the feathering amount. So this is a good way to add a vignette because you're getting a visual representation of where it's going to go. And you can always push the feathering up later, but making sure that your size is right is more important first. So that's what we're doing here. So we're gonna pull that back out and now we're gonna add the feathering. And that's much better vignette. We'll go ahead and close that out. We're gonna leave our border off for now because the last thing that I wanna do is show you how to use our brightness brush. On the left-hand side of your image, there's a little tool well. We haven't talked about this yet. The top three tools are your brightness brush, which gives you the ability to brush in lightness or darkness. You have a contrast brush where you can paint in more or less contrast, and then a detail brush. If there's anywhere in your image where you want to add more detail or you want to remove some, you have that tool. You also have something called the selective color brush, which if used, I'm going to make it very obvious here, you can actually bring back color information just by painting over your photo. So for this image, I could paint back color in, in a selective area of my photo if I wanted maybe just part of my image to be back in color. Now, the brightness brush, and the reason why we're going to be working with this here, is you may end up with an image like this one where you've got a darker area of your photo. There's this tree on the left-hand side of the image here that's pretty dark, 
And I can go through and I can use my shadow slider to kind of lighten it up a little bit, but it's still pretty dark. And we don't want to ruin those darker shadows on the right hand side. So we're going to leave our shadow slider pretty low and we're going to choose the brightness brush. You want to make sure that your mode is set to lighten because we want to lighten up the tree. You can play around with things like feathering and the amount or intensity of the brightness. I like to drop my amount slider pretty low because I like to be very careful about how much I add at once. And then you can also choose our perfect brush, which is our edge detection brush. Now, once you have all these options set, just click. We're actually going to raise that back up so we can really see what's going on. Just click and drag over the part of the image that you want to be lighter. So we're very quickly clicking and dragging over this tree. We're going over some of the branches here. So we're going that one, maybe lighten up that area there. You can use it multiple times if you want to lighten up multiple areas. So we're just clicking and dragging over these spots again. And there we go. So now we have a much brighter tree on the left hand side. And if we swap our mode over to darken, we could maybe darken part of the right hand side. Now you can use this tool with or without the perfect brush. When you turn the perfect brush off and you darken, what can happen is you don't get a very soft edge on the area where you, you're darkening and your original image. So what I suggest, if you're using it without the perfect brush on, you want to raise your feathering amount all the way up to 100. You want to create a very soft edged brush so that you can create just a little bit of darkness in one go. You'll also notice that I'm making my brush really big. I want a nice big soft brush to do one big sweep across the right hand side. So we're just clicking and we're going to drag just once, maybe twice if we're feeling a little fancy and we're darkening that right hand side. We're creating a little bit more of interest in the center of the image because we still have this nice bright spot underneath the area where the trees are hanging down and we've got these kind of mossy, mossy bits. We're just deepening the area on the right to decrease some of the intensity that's happening over there. So just with that brightness tool, we completely changed how this image looked. We're lightening and darkening specific areas to maybe even them out a little bit more, or we're changing the area of interest in a photo. Now, just like before, we're going to finish our image off with a border and with sharpening. There are many different types of borders for your photo. There's one called simple, and these are going to be very basic, things like pin line borders with rounded edges. We also have some called our sloppy borders. And these will be, again, very, very simple. So if you want something that isn't quite as crazy as the one that we last did, um, you can change the size of the border just by using the size slider at the bottom of the pane. So this is pretty close towards the center of my image. I'm going to move this out quite a ways, probably to about number eight there. So I can just barely see it along the edge of my image and I'm not cutting off as much information. And then again, we'll finish our image off with a little bit of sharpening. Not a lot, just like we did before. I'm going to use the progressive sharpening, but I'm going to lower the amount down a little bit because I don't want to get it quite as intense as it was. Now I'm going to go ahead and just like last time, we're going to click apply and we're going to jump back into Lightroom. And we'll be able to take a look at our color photo and our black and white photo. This is the image that we started out with. This is what we got after a little bit of HDR work on this image, combining a couple photos together. And then this is our black and white photo. Now this image, you could have done many other treatments to it. You didn't have to go the way that I went. You could go a little bit more of that film route that I, I started out with, with my original image, or you could do this kind of cleaner, cleaner selenium toner style look. You have many different things that you could have done to this image. I wanted to go that cleaner route for this photo just so I could show you some of the differences that you can do inside perfect black and white. 